in disorganized attachment, what happens is one of the parents or both or the family scenario was too chaotic or too scary or too threatening in some way that the attachment systems, you know, were programmed like it's an instinct, just like to eat and drink, you know, um, it's instinct to connect to our caregivers because they're supposed to be our protectors. And when we're born, we're pretty defenseless as little babies. So we need that protection. So it feels like a life threat. It feels like a survival issue if um, your environment's not safe. And so here's the attachment system from the little one trying, doing everything to connect, you know, with eye contact and gurgles and coos and reaching out and and all, maybe even crying, like using a signal cry to get attention to connect. And then if the parent is so dissociated from maybe their own trauma history or their, you um, just not available in a sense of severe neglect or there's too much chaos, but might happen if someone's in an addictive household, somebody's addicted to something in a household, or there could be things that nobody can help, like extreme poverty or being born into a war zone, or there's just different dynamics that set up too much fear um, in the in the situation. So when you're trying to bond, uh, it tends to go to a trauma response, like a fight, flight, freeze, or fix or fawn uh, response instead of really having a successful bonding. So the the thing with disorganized is it's it doesn't have a particular pattern like the ones that we talked about in January, the avoidant or the ambivalent. So very often the research shows that people that are therapists they often were called to their profession because they sometimes have a little unresolved, even just a little bit of unresolved uh, disorganized attachment in their history. So you might. Be considering whether there's something you feel like might be uh, affecting you as well. I know that's true for me. And many people when I'm doing live training is a lot of people respond that they, they can relate to that statement. Um, not everybody, but many people. And um, you can have situational disorganized, which means that instead of moving you know, completely into dissociation or kind of having a lifestyle of numbing out or having rage outbursts or panic attacks or these kind of more severe responses, these extreme emotional shifts that if you have chronic disorganized would be part of the package that you might see in your clients or certain people that you know, or sometimes ourselves, um, that can also be situational. So maybe there's a certain one trigger, you know, or, or a few triggers, like maybe you had a parent that yelled a lot when you were a kid. So now loud, loud noises kind of fragment you or you shift to numbing out or dis, uh, disconnecting in some way. So sometimes it's just situational. And, uh, and the rest of the time, you're pretty much either one of the insecure attachment styles like avoidant or ambivalent, or you're insecure, you are in the secure attachment style. So, um, You'll be able to read a little more about the details of each of the attachment styles on my website. When you take the quiz, it'll give you some information. Um, there's also the book that Denise mentioned in the CD series that she mentioned. One is called The Power of Attachment. One is called, the CDs are called Healing Your Attachment Wounds. They're both produced by Sounds True. Um, but that's just some more information, you know. I'm going to try to give you a, a good overview of disorganized. We, I sort of have an ambitious agenda today, so I, there's a lot I'd like to show you. I'd like to show you a little bit of a demo working with someone that had a very frightening history, um, and I'll, it's a. We'll see how much of that I can show you, but it'll be available for you to take a look at. Um, we can't let you download it because for the client's privacy, but you can watch it in the membership site. Um, and then also, because you have this conflict between the attachment bond that wants to love and be held and comforted and nurtured and all of that, um, and then this threat response that wants to get the heck out of there or fight or, you know, just go kind of numb out and dissociate, uh, that's a very, it's the one attachment style that's mixed with trauma the most. So I, it's helpful to be an attachment informed and a trauma informed therapist when you're working with these dynamics. And it's the most confusing because you're, you're actually feeling the emotional, cognitive and somatic confusion that somebody encounters when they've had a shock trauma or an ongoing childhood trauma of that magnitude. And of course, that would be any kind of abuse history, emotional, physical, sexual, these lead to disorganized attachment. And it's it's challenging. I mean, you can have a little bit of it or a lot of it, right? Like any of the attachment styles. Um, but I want to give you kind of an appreciation for how you might work with it. Um, 
so that you, I'm not just telling you about it, but you're also seeing what you can actually do about it, right? See the work in action. Um, so just to know it's a little more unpredictable than the other working with the other attachment issues um, because there isn't any particular pattern. People can be fine and then they can dysregulate and be into a panic attack or be into a rage outburst or be into complete dissociation. Uh, so it's it's a little bit more challenging. So it really helps if you understand how to regulate and, and the somatic focus that many of you have, even just coming to Embody Lab that specializes in that. It really helps to to also add the the taking the experience somebody's having into the body and tracking the sensation and tracking the nervous system and helping the nervous system regulate. So that's what I want to show you in the demo. But because this one has the most threat involved and the most danger, it's really important that we establish a sense of safety, some kind of physiological access to safety. Um, so that really helps the person calm their nervous system, learn to relax and hopefully a relatively more safe environment today than they had maybe when they were children. But then that's not always true because some people are living in domestic violence situations as adults or with a partner that's unsafe. So I'm going to talk about it more from an historical point of view, and I'm going to help you like work with those early dynamics. And then of course, it's this is the most complicated one. So um, there's there's a lot to it. So one of the things is that we want to um, have an appreciation for the threat response that can just intrude on someone's experience at any time when they aren't least expecting it and kind of hijack them into a, a fearful state or angry state or defensive state that's on the more extreme side. So one of the things um, that I like to do is I call it a uh, distancing the threat like usually when people tap into their threat response they feel like it's right here like it's right really close and scary because it's so close so one of the things that you can e easily do in treatment is just say okay I want you to imagine and I usually try to separate the behavior from the parent so let's say it was a an alcoholic father who got enraged when he drank too much you could just you could say I know there's a part of you that really loves and appreciates your father but let's keep that intact but let's just see if we can put that yelling or that sort of abusive um, way of interacting as far away from you as your body wants it to be now some people are going to want that threat like in the corner of the room so they can keep track of it. Other people are going to want it as far away from them as they can. One of my clients, when I asked this question, she said, I want this perpetrator on the edge of the ever expanding universe. <laughs> One of my favorite responses because you just said going further and further and further away. So, but as you distance the threat and you kind of freeze frame it there, that's a really important part. Like just let them imagine the threatening behavior in a big block of ice or an old-fashioned English telephone booth. And I'm sure they don't have any more with cell phones, but something that they're muting the, they can't hear the voice, it's muted, um, the person can't move, but they can. So this is called reversing the immobil immobilization response. Because a lot of times when people go into threat, they just freeze, right? And they get really constricted in the body and their nervous system's out of whack and 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 they're, they're, they're not in their prefrontal cortex anymore. They're getting hijacked into the limbic brain. So it's really important that you have the threat immobilized and then you, you can say that now that the threat is frozen, what is it your body wants to say or do when the threat can't say anything, can't respond, can't be violent, can't do anything to harm you. What is it your body wants to do or say to that threatening behavior? I'm going to bite me back off or leave me alone or, you know, don't treat me that way. It could be, and sometimes full of expletives. Sometimes when you're in trauma, you're swearing like a sailor. That's okay. I don't mind that language. And so you just make a space where people can allow their defensive responses to be evoked and felt and expressed and and completed that helps the whole body relax and expand out of the constriction so that's a really really helpful um, way of working with it distancing the threat um, immobilizing the threat and then inviting the person to do or say whatever they want to do or say and sometimes that takes them back to an early younger child state 
And because when we're young, we're learning how to protect ourselves from adults protecting us. This is leading into this exercise we're going to do in just a few minutes. I'm going to let Denise know that that's happening. Um, you want to understand that developmentally, if you're accessing like a two-year-old or a three-year-old or four-year-old, five, six little kid, developmentally, it would make more sense for them to have an adult protect them in an ideal world, right? So you you might want to say, well, is there someone that you felt that knew how to be protective and actually has the capacity to be protective that could come either be imported from today, right? Like I would be happy to be that person as a therapist for my for my client or for anybody here. And or or sometimes it's even a person from a movie or a book or someone they've seen in media somehow or it's a teacher they had when they were in school, or it could be a grandparent that's already passed away, but someone that has that, they're protective, but they're no nonsense about it. Like they're not just saying it, they're going to do something or say something or intervene in some way if something's not going well. And because many people that are carrying abuse histories forward into their life, they didn't have that or the abuse wouldn't have happened, right? It wouldn't have continued to happen. They would have gotten stopped. So very often in with disorganized attachment, you're in a situation with a client um, or sometimes it's us, right? Um, that they just never really felt safe. They don't even know what that means. They look at you like, what? You know, so we we need to help their physiology connect with some element of safety and to actually embody it and to feel it. And that starts to shift their experience. And of course, we always need our threat response when we're actually in danger. The difficulty with unresolved trauma, which is what disorganized attachment is called from the adult style, uh, the, the younger child history is called either type D, dissociated, or um, disorganized, like I'm calling it today. So you'll see it referred to in different ways in different literature. But we really want to see if we can restore some access to physiological safety. And for some clients that don't feel like they have a really hard time getting there, I might do what I call relative safety. Do you, do you have a day this week that you felt a little bit safer than the other days or less anxious or less dissociated or less angry. So you do it by range. And very often people say, well, you know, on Tuesday, I was out with my friends and I really felt like they were celebrating my birthday and they were really supportive and I felt a little more relaxed. So sometimes you're starting with a little bit and moving to grow it, right? I've had people that don't trust people enough. So we might start with their love of plants or their love of animals. I mean, I have clients that were tree huggers that really helped them. They felt the strength of the tree and the wood, and that would be a starting point. You're looking for where you can start to move in the direction of embodied safety. And sometimes it's trees and then eventually animals and then eventually human beings. But we're eventually hoping that we can get to human beings over time because there's so much regulation that happens in healthy connection. So we're really trying to build a bridge back to secure attachment, which is where a, a person is attuned to you. They're naturally protective of you and the relationship. They have good boundaries. They're playful. Um, they're attuned. They kind of understand and can reflect your emotional states or your experience in an accurate way. They're not perfect, but even when misattunements happen, they know how to initiate repair. They have good uh, rituals. I call them secure attachment skills to reconnect a bond if a bond has been disrupted for some reason. And there's just a lot to that, which we talked about in part one. So given the time we have, I'm going to jump into um, the disorganized focus. And I think you can catch up and understand what we're doing.